Today we'll start taking a look at the cardiovascular system in our discussion of human anatomy and physiology. Chapter 19. We've learned quite a bit about blood, the transport medium of the cardiovascular system, and we know quite a bit about the heart now from chapter 18, which propels that blood through. Now we need to put it all together with the blood vessels and see how the body's homeostatic mechanisms make it all work in, in a stable and, and consistent way. So blood vessels, we haven't really talked about those yet, so let's take a look at this diagram, generalized uh, diagram of the structure of arteries and veins. There's essentially three layers to these uh, blood vessels. The inner layers, layer or layers, called the tunica intima, consists of the endothelium, right, the simple squamous epithelial cells that line the vessels, and then there's a basement membrane, some aerial or connective tissue, the so-called subendothelial layer. And there's some elastic connective tissue in there. Then we have the bulkiest part of the vessel wall, the tunica media. Sometimes it's just called the media of the vessel. Um, and it's made up of smooth muscle and elastic filaments or elastic protein fibers. Um, and the amount of, the relative amount of elastin versus smooth muscle varies in different um, parts of, a, of, a, of the vascular system that those two are the big players in there and it's the thickest part of the wall. And then we have an outer jacket on the, on the blood vessels, the tunica externa, right, a little connective tissue covering. Um, the vasovasorum is not found in all blood vessels. That's just referring to a unique characteristic of extra large vessels in which there's so much tissue involved here that there's actually a vascular network, blood vessels in the wall of the blood vessel. So that's called the base of a sore. How cool is that? Um, blood capillaries are the smallest vessels, and they're just essentially one cell thick tubes made up of endothelial cells. So they don't have all these, these characteristic layers to them. <clears throat> all right, so here's an artery and a vein to illustrate an important principle. Um, arteries are smaller in diameter and thicker in wall. This vein is all flattened out because when the tissue sample was collected, the, there was no, no, any longer any blood pressure in these vessels. And so the vein, veins have thin kind of baggy walls and they're easily compressed or collapsed when there's no blood inside there. But think of this thing being stretched out into a, into a cylinder, a much larger diameter than the artery. You can see that also in this diagram. Another thing about veins is veins have one-way valves. They're like miniature versions of the semilunar valves in the aorta and, and the um, pulmonary trunk. So blood can only travel in one direction through veins. And we have mentioned that before when we talked about um, impact of various um, various variables on venous return during exercise. Muscle pumping, right, depends on valves in the veins. When the muscles contract, it pushes blood back towards the heart only. All right. Here's another little schematic diagram of the whole system. The heart pump pushes blood out into the arteries, stretching their elastic walls, right? Some force pushing that blood out there. <clears throat> the largest arteries are called elastic arteries because of the, the amount of elastin in the tunica media. And then as we branch to smaller and smaller arteries, the arteries become more and more muscular. And then finally, we, we come down to the terminal arterioles. Arterioles are very small arteries. The very last branch before we come to, a, to capillaries is called the terminal arteriole. And then we come to capillaries, <clears throat> and then to venules, very small veins, and the venules keep coalescing together to form larger and larger veins. A couple of things to note about this diagram, which is kind of nice. Um, capillaries, blood capillaries, are leaky. How strange, right? We cycle this fluid, the blood, through this system over and over again. And every minute, essentially, we pump the whole volume through the vascular system. And yet, a tiny bit of the water leaks out of all the capillaries constantly. So they ooze out water. What happens to that water? Well, there's a whole other vascular system called the lymphatic system that you may or may not have heard of much before. If you have heard of it, you've probably heard of it largely in the context of lymph nodes, which are a place that houses the, a lot of the immune system, the white blood cells. But 
it's a system designed to scavenge up all the water that leaks out of the blood vessels and then pipe it back into the, into the cardiovascular system. Here's a great big vein here, a subclavian vein, and we're gonna dump that, that water right back in there. So that's the lymphatic system. Another thing to mention is that um, when you see, and then we have a capillary, a group of capillaries, a web of capillaries and a venial, that cluster or web of capillaries there is called a capillary bed. And this is where all of the exchange happens, all the important diffusion, blood gases, nutrients, and so forth, cross over this of the, of the blood capillaries. <clears throat> so elastic arteries have a thick tunica media made up of a lot of elastic connective tissue. As we branch the smaller arteries, they become more and more muscular, more smooth muscle than anything else in the tunica media, and eventually come to very tiny arteries called arterioles, uh, very small, small vessels that give rise to blood capillaries. So again, this is a <clears throat> just words of word slides that you can use to review what I've already been talking about. Okay, let's now move to the next stage, capillaries. So blood capillaries, like as I said, are the site of nutrients and, nutrients and gas exchange. They are single cell thick tubes. There are other cells besides endothelial cells. There are parasites interspersed here and there on the walls of blood capillaries. Uh, their, their function isn't entirely understood. The, the capillaries are so narrow that red blood cells have to kind of squeeze into them. So as the blood is forced into the capillaries, the super elastic, soft and elastic red blood cells just kind of squeeze right in there and get pushed single file uh, down the, the capillaries until they pop out the other side into a venial. That forces the, 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 the wall of the capillary to touch the red blood red blood cell all around and the hemoglobin is peripherally located in the red blood cells so there's a the minimum distance for diffusion of oxygen under those conditions. So capillaries are found in all the tissues of your body except cartilage, right? We know that that has no blood vessels. It has to be fed by um, synovial fluid and by capillaries in the, in the perichondrium. <coughs> And the cornea and lens of your eye have no blood vessels, but they're transparent. The cornea has live cells on the surface, and they're fed, they receive their oxygen directly from the air, it diffuses right into the, the lacrimal fluid, the tear fluid on your eyes, and into the cells of the cornea. So the, the capillaries come within 20 microns or less of every, virtually every cell in your body. That's the essential um, maximum distance away that cells can be and really have a good livelihood as far as getting oxygen and nutrients from the capillaries. Here's a cool micrograph showing cardiac muscle tissue. And you can see capillaries all woven in among the, along, among the uh, heart muscle cells. And you can see the red blood cells just packed right in there, stuffed right in those capillaries. Here's another illustration I like to use to, so you can get a feel for this. This is an alveolus of the lung we're looking inside of. And the alveolus of the lung is made up of simple squamous epithelial cells. How thin are simple squamous cells? You can't even hardly tell they're there. They're draped over these blood capillaries. You can see the capillaries as if there are nothing on them. So you can see a little bit of a, of, a, of a type 1 epithelial cell there. So very, very thin cells draped over blood capillaries, which are made of very, very thin simple squamous ep epithelial cells. Amazingly short distance for the diffusion of oxygen. Anyway, here are red blood cells emerging from a capillary. You can see how tightly packed they are. There is no extra space in there. And the whole point is we want to get the oxygen across that alveolar wall from the air inside here and into the blood as rapidly as possible. And if this capillary was in another organ or tissue, you'd want to get that oxygen out of the red blood cell and across this boundary between the, the, the wall of the capillary as quickly as possible. So they're really packed in there. Well, there's three types of capillaries I'd like to um, um, bring up for you and describe. Um, and this first category of capillaries is called continuous capillaries, and they're the most common uh, type of capillary in your entire body. Part of the reason I made all the emphasis about um, packing the red blood cells in is that um, artists can't seem to stand to draw them that way. And here's a 
typical example of a drawing of a capillary in which a red blood cell is just bobbing along in the plasma, floating along like, like you on an inner tube in the lazy river up at sea breeze. No, they're packed in there, squeezing along the walls of the capillary. Anyway, it's neither here nor there. Now, long, now you know how it really is. Anyway, the endothelial cells are stitched together by tight junctions. It's very hard for water and solutes to get between these endothelial cells. But some water does ooze through there and leak out. Some proteins do leak out. Not much, but some, some do. So tight junctions of continuous capillaries uh, um, will, you know, keep very good track of what's in the, in the blood and versus what's leaking out. So the least permeable capillaries in your brain, they're especially tight, right? We talk about the blood-brain barrier. Very good control of movement of solutes from the blood into the interstitial space in the cerebral spinal fluid. Astrocytes, in that case, also help provide another layer of control to about, you know, as far as what goes out of the, out of the blood plasma into the cerebral spinal fluid and interstitial fluid. Okay, second category of, of blood capillaries, fenestrated capillaries. A fenster in German means a window. And a lot of our, as you probably have, have noticed already, I'm sure you've noticed already, that a lot of the terminology in the cardiovascular system uh, uh, arises from German language because um, the Germans had premier uh, research science going on at the time when this was the subject of study. So windowed capillaries. Some holes are present in the wall of these capillaries, and they leak a lot intentionally. There's a lot of access of <clears throat> the connection between the plasma and the surrounding fluid, and vice versa. So where would we need this kind of permeability, permeability leakiness um, in the small intestine? Where there's a ton of absorption happening. There's a lot of access. There's a lot of pathways for, for nutrients to get absorbed into the blood from the from the epithelial, across the epithelium of the, of the small intestine and so forth. Also, in the kidneys. The kidneys have some specialized structures in which blood capillaries just weep out fluid like crazy under hot, relatively high pressure. And that's how we form urine. Urine just is just water coming straight from the blood plasma minus the proteins, right? The water's gonna ooze out through all these, these little pores into a container, the, the, the renal capsule, the glomerular capsule, and then we're gonna take that fluid that's pouring out of those capillaries and reabsorb, as I've mentioned a number of times, reabsorb 99 point something percent of it back into the blood and pee out a small bit. So fenestrated capillaries in the kidneys and the glomeruli. All right, finally we come to sinusoidal capillaries. These guys are wide open and they're found in the liver. Structural units of the liver are sometimes called sinusoids, and these are the capillaries that are present, and they allow a great deal of contact between the blood plasma and the actual liver cells, the hepatocytes. The liver cells are major metabolic sort of powerhouses of your body. They have tons of extra enzymes that no other cells have. They can do all kinds of, of modification of chemicals and detoxification of, of nasty chemicals that come into your body and your diet. All kind of good stuff happens there, so uh, they need access to the blood plasma so you don't poison yourself. So that's what you see in the liver. Incidentally, in the in the little gaps between the, the in the walls of the capillaries and the sinusoidal capillaries of the liver are macrophages. There's macrophages all around here to help gobble up any debris that's in the blood as it's passing through the liver. The liver is a place where if there's some junk in your blood from whether it's from tissue injury and, and breakdown or whether it's something that's gotten into your blood from, from say something in your diet, um, it's gonna get gobbled up. Fiber, little chunks of fiber and after breaking down a blood clot, macrophages in the liver, liver will gobble up any of that debris and the blood will come out crystal clear, which is a few cells floating in it. Pretty cool organ. There was actually a, a, a faculty member at University of Rochester a Medical Center right in our city here who received the Nobel Prize for uh, the discovery of that function of the liver to clear the blood of uh, many types of debris that might be present through the action of these Kupfer cells that are called macrophages in the, in the capillaries of the liver. 
Oh, what was his name? Leon. That's disappointing. I'm disappointed. I can't remember his name. Very important to understand the history, I think, of the sciences. And, you know, Leon Miller. He had an office uh, over at Strong when I was, even back when I was working there, he was an older man and he, he had his office for life. However long he wanted to keep coming in and coming to work every day, he came right in and he did his thing. It's pretty cool to meet him and, and know about him. <clears throat> Here's another schematic diagram, just like one we've seen before of a capillary bed. Here's a terminal arterial. And here's a sort of web of capillaries and blood enters those capillaries and flows through all these branches to feed all the cells in the vicinity and then into a venule and then into veins and back to the heart. Well, a couple of things I'd like to emphasize that I didn't mention in the last diagram, so I didn't repeat myself too much, but one thing that may happen here is blood can pass right through this so-called thoroughfare channel. Another name for it is an anastomosis a shortcut right from an artery to a vein or an arterial to a venule. There are larger anastomoses, but these channels can allow blood to bypass this capillary bed. In the worst case scenario, when we want to just shut down this capillary bed, we can activate smooth muscle sphincters or cuffs at the opening of the capillaries from the from this, um, this met arterial or, or thoroughfare channel and close them right off by constriction and force the blood right over to the veins. But typically what happens is a subset of those cuffs is open at any given moment and a subset is closed. So some of these capillaries will, will be receiving blood flow and then there'll be like a tag team effect. The cuffs that were open will then close and some other cuffs will open and blood will flow through some of the other capillaries and keep doing that so that at rest oftentimes all the capillaries are not needed. And so we swap out which capillaries are carrying blood at any given moment. In exercising muscles, for example, when we need to then upregulate the flow through that muscle a great deal to, uh, to provide sustenance for the increase in metabolism in the muscle cells, then we may open up all of these sphincters and let blood flow through all the capillaries. So we have a lot of reserve uh, capacity for flow in organs, especially in skeletal muscles. So a shunt is just a shortcut from one place to another. Typically, a, a shunt means from the arterial side of the circuit to, to the venous side without going through capillaries. So, capillaries, then blood enters into venules, very, very small veins. They have a little bit more substance to their walls, some smooth muscle in there that's not found in capillaries. And then finally into larger and larger veins, which have a tunica media with some smooth muscle and some elastic tissue. But again, very large diameter and small um, um, thick, thin wall. I mean. <clears throat> the veins are so big around that about two-thirds of the blood, the volume of your blood, is sitting in the vein, not sitting, but passing through the veins on, on its way back to the heart. So if we look to see how much blood is in the ar arteries, how much blood is in the arterioles, how much blood is in the capillaries and so forth, um, the majority of blood, two-thirds of the blood, is in the veins at any given moment. We'll see that that's a wonderful reservoir effect that we can take advantage of. Here's a way of describing those relative volumes in a pie chart. How much of the blood is in each one of those different types of vessels at any given moment? Two-thirds or so in the veins. Big, bulky, baggy, large diameter vessels carrying the blood back towards the heart from the vascular beds. So as I mentioned, anastomoses are like shortcut blood vessels from one place to another. If it's a shunt, an arteriovenous shunt, or an arteriovenous anastomosis, then that means it's a way for blood to skip through capillaries and go right from, from arteries to veins. Um, there's a lot of excess blood vessels in the papillary dermis because it has a role in maintaining blood pressure. Sometimes you want to deliver a lot of extra blood flow to the dermis in order to help get rid of some heat energy from that blood. And so there's a lot of extra capacity for blood flow that we don't need otherwise. And so in the case that we don't need it, a lot of uh, shunts will, will uh, minimize the, the wasted flow in parts of the skin where we don't really need that much flow. Um, <clears throat> arterial anastomoses connect arteries together so that if blood is flowing through one artery and branches and then comes to a roadblock, it can cut through an anastomosis and get back to the same uh, tissue it was headed for. Um, they're just. This is just like collateral circulation. It's called alternative pathways 
sometimes arteries get compressed or sometimes arteries actually become blocked and this is allows blood to get to all your tissues critical venous anastomoses are even more common because veins are so low in pressure they get compressed a lot as you're sitting here right now or lying wherever you are watching this 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 recording there's lots of veins that are being compressed by your body weight and blood can't flow through them blood has to get back to the heart somehow from every tissue every capillary bed and so it'll go through an anastomosis a alternative route back to the heart and pretty soon if you do that long enough you'll feel uncomfortable because some tissues aren't getting as good of blood flow as they'd like and you'll feel uncomfortable and you'll naturally without even thinking about it roll to a different position or move in your seat to a different position to allow some other veins to get compressed and let the let the blood flow where it hasn't been all right so join me next time as we start talking about blood pressure and flow i've mentioned flow a number of times well now we can really get into hemodynamics what are the rules the physics laws essentially that govern um, the control of pressure and flow and so forth and then once we understand that then we can really uh, understand how the cardiovascular system works and what happens during disease